So the topic for today is digital therapeutics, and I will be speaking to the, uh, the initial part of the presentation, which is the need um, for treatment um, and uh, problems with access, uh, and at the same time having evidence-based treatments available. Um, my disclosures, I have ISO and Lyra Health, and uh, the views are my own. They're all based on peer-reviewed references, um, but not reflective of my affiliated or organizations. The program is uh, provided by NACME and supported by an educational grant. And the learning objectives. One is to identify current patient and healthcare system level barriers that contribute to suboptimal addiction management access and outcomes. Describe how the translation of digital therapeutics to practice may address current challenges in the delivery of SUD and OUD treatment, substance use disorders and opioid use disorders. Evaluate currently available digital therapeutics for SUD and OUD and overcome barriers to the effective integration of digital therapeutics into SUD and OUD treatment plans. I'm going to be talking about uh, access to um, mental health care specifically substance use disorders. So in 2008, we were fortunate that the, that the Mental Health Parity and Equity Act was passed. And basically that meant that we needed to treat mental health and substance use disorders the same as we treat other health conditions. So that insurers needed to have the financial requirements and treatment limitations applicable to mental health and substance use and have them be no more restrictive than for other medical and surgical benefits. Before that, as many of us know, uh, mental health and substance use disorders were not considered as being um, sometimes medically necessary or always being covered. And so the Mental Health Parity Act made, was a huge step in the right direction. Uh, in 2010, the Affordable Care Act was passed, and that allowed 37 million uninsured Americans to gain coverage. And what that also meant is that a lot of people gained access to mental health care and it changed the nature of coverage available in non-group and small group markets. So in theory, over the last 10 years, 10 to 11 years, we've had an increase in the ability to cover substance use disorder and mental health uh, treatments and diagnoses. Um, but that's in theory, because just because we can potentially cover it doesn't mean that everyone's going to get the treatment that needs to happen. So we've had great progress in coverage and eligibility, but we still see every day in the, in the news media headlines, in peer-reviewed publications, we still see that not enough people are getting treatment. We still see that there is an overdose epidemic that's occurring. Um, there's been some movement in that and some reductions, but we still see poor outcomes and lack of access. So where's the disconnect? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about current substance use disorder epidemiology to understand um, the basis and the foundation in order to talk about the treatment and the lack of access. So this data is from SAMHSA, and um, out of uh, in the in the U.S., approximately eight percent of people have a substance use disorder in the past year. Um, and I'll point out that this does not include tobacco use disorder. If we include tobacco use disorder, uh, which is the most prevalent substance use disorder, then that piece of the pie would be much higher, much larger. Um, but SAMHSA classifies it as such, so uh, we'll go with this, these data. Um, and alcohol use disorder is the most common substance use disorder second to tobacco, um, followed by illicit drug use disorder, marijuana use disorder, prescription pain, cocaine, and heroin. Um, and this is substance use disorder and not abuse. So there's, gen there's certainly a lot more substance abuse going on and um, maladaptive patterns of use, but these are folks that meet criteria for substance use disorders. And I want to be very specific about substance use disorder. We had talked about um, in one of the pre-questions what defines a substance use disorder. So when DSM-5 was created, luckily, a lot of the substance use disorders that had um, uh, different criteria uh, before, and they, were, they had different names um, and different sets of criteria for each of them, were integrated into one common definition. So the substance use disorder, this one happens to be for alcohol, but you really replace alcohol with whatever the substance is and you're able to have the definition uh, remain. And ultimately, it really focuses on two things. Again, that maladaptive pattern 
and affecting somebody's functioning um, and, uh, and causing distress. So you need to have at least two of these criteria um, over a 12 month period. And I'll give examples of this and this is gonna feel, um, this is gonna uh, make it such that all of the substances and even when we come to things like um, non-substances like gambling use disorder or gaming disorder as we're thinking about the DSM and, and uh, changes in the DSM and future directions for the DSM, these would still apply. So the substances used uh, uh, larger amounts uh, or over a longer period than intended. There's a persistent or unsuccessful desire to quit. Uh, cravings, um, tolerance, that used to be split up in, in the former DSM version, but tolerance is a need for markedly increased amounts of the substance and a diminished effect when using the same amount and withdrawal um, having a withdrawal uh, syndrome for that particular substance. Um, and for alcohol specifically, withdrawal, as we know, um, can be dangerous. All right, so I'm gonna go over kind of four classes of substances uh, to really get into the weeds of this. So we'll start with alcohol use disorder. 6.2% of adults have alcohol use disorder. 29.6% uh, uh, report that they have engaged in binge drinking, that's five or more drinks, in the past month, and 7% have engaged in heavy alcohol use that's binging on five or more days in the past month. Um, only 8% of uh, adults who reported needing treatment for an alcohol problem received specialty alcohol treatment. And this statistic goes from about 6% to 8%, depending on which national survey you look at. So only that percent of people who need the treatment actually get it, um, and furthermore, in those, in those six to eight percent, it's not clear whether all of the people getting the treatment are getting evidence-based treatment. Uh, mortality and morbidity also is very strong with alcohol. Um, 88,000 deaths in a year, making it the third leading preventable cause of death uh, in the US, and I'll talk about the leading preventable cause of death as well. And then of course there's morbidity uh, associated with alcohol. Um, so decreased uh, productivity, um, uh, billions of dollars lost on uh, healthcare costs uh, associated with alcohol, hospitalizations, need for treatment, um, as well as acute and chronic effects, for example, on the brain, um, increasing uh, risk of many cancers and so on. So there's three FDA approved medications for alcohol use disorder. Uh, the first one is naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist, reduces the re risk of relapse to drinking and a return to binge drinking, and it also comes in a once monthly uh, injectable form. Um, acamprosate uh, is the second medication. The advantage of acamprosate um, is that it is processed through the kidney and not the liver, so if people have uh, liver issues as a result of their alcohol use, then this might be a medication, although oftentimes we can go to three or four times the, um, the normal limits of, of uh, liver enzymes to prescribe naltrexone. And then disulfiram, which is antabuse, um, and it is the medication uh, that blocks the path of alcohol. So alcohol is normally processed through the liver and comes out as something that's inert and can, can uh, leave our system. But if you take disulfiram, then it blocks one of the enzyme and you have a buildup of toxic substances that can make people sick. So if somebody takes disulfiram, then they're not supposed to be able to drink for anywhere from that day to up to two weeks, depending on the, how their body processes it. So you remember to take the medication, and you know you will get sick if you drink, and that prevents you from drinking. It doesn't necessarily reduce cravings. And then psychosocial interventions. I really want to stress that even though I'm talking about medication specifically, that psychosocial um, interventions are extremely important to all of these substance use disorders. And when we combine medications and psychosocial interventions, we have better outcomes. So um, there is a lot of effort trying to get just the medications out to folks because they're so underprescribed. But again, when we pair them with psychosocial approaches, we really do get better rates of uh, people adhering to treatment as well as uh, better outcome numbers. So meta-analysis of 15,000 patients showed that even those who received brief psychosocial interventions reduced alcohol intake compared to those with no interventions at one year. And brief interventions are particularly important as they've been studied for 40 years for alcohol, um, where if somebody is using alcohol in a risky manner and they simply get that brief intervention when they're in the ER or at their primary care visit, 
that can go a very long way. And there's very little training needed for brief interventions and multiple disciplines can do them. So brief interventions, just a lot of data, reduces uh, hospitalizations, reduces uh, heavy drinking days, um, and reduces uh, costs to healthcare systems um, simply by spending 10 to 15 minutes with a patient and then following up briefly with them. Tobacco use disorder. So my area of research is in tobacco use um, and tobacco use disorders. Uh, luckily, the number of current U.S. smokers has been steadily going down, um, but it's still not uh, as low as we would want it to be. It is responsible for nearly 500,000 deaths annually. And that should still concern us. The fact that tobacco, even with all of the progress we've made, is still the leading preventable cause of death in this country. And it's associated with more morbidity and mortality than alcohol and all other drugs combined. I want to pause with that because this is important. When somebody comes through our office and uh, we're treating them for whatever other substance use disorder may seem more acute or, or important at the moment, um, if we forget tobacco use disorder, uh, as you know, I have been guilty of many times when I'm providing somebody with a buprenorphine prescription or working with them on their alcohol use, I might forget to ask about tobacco, but if I forget to ask about tobacco, just asking, just asking and letting them know that that's important to me as their physician, then I'm missing an opportunity to treat the one thing that's probably going to lead to their eventual getting sick and passing away. So do people with, who are tobacco users want to quit? 70% of them do want to quit, and half of smokers try to quit each year. So it's not that when someone comes into my office, they don't want to hear me. They probably do want to hear me. And, there's, and even if they say they don't want to hear me, there's probably a voice in the back of their head saying, I should probably listen to this uh, and think about this. Um, so relapse rates are pretty high. It is a, nicotine is highly addictive. Two thirds of people, unfortunately, don't use evidence-based treatment. We have so much research on tobacco use disorders, and yet two thirds of people don't use an evidence-based treatment method. Less than a third of people use medications. The medications across the board increase quit rates. Uh, less than 10% use behavioral counseling, and less than 6% use both medication and behavioral counseling. It's mind-boggling for me. Again, we have so much research on this, and yet it's so underused. Um, screening is happening in two-thirds of physician visits, but among patients who are identified as current tobacco users, only 21% received counseling, and only 8% received medication. Study after study after study shows that even if we're asking the question, which is great, again, I don't, wanna, I don't want to uh, understate how important that is, um, even if we're asking the question, we're not taking the next step and providing the treatment. These are the medications that are available. There's five nicotine replacement therapies, and there's two pills that are available. Uh, one is varenicline, and the other one is bupropion. Um, varenicline being the newer one. Varenicline, I think of as, I explained to my patients, as buprenorphine for uh, nicotine. Um, the, out of the five nicotine replacement therapies, three are over the counter, very easy to access, um, and they all improve efficacy rates compared to placebo. Um, and I always like to remind my patients that even if they tried with one in the past, that's okay, we can try it again, because as a chronic disease, it often takes more than one try to treat tobacco. Opioid use disorder. Uh, what is getting the most attention right now, as it should be, um, but again, I don't want us to forget about alcohol and tobacco, uh, the rate of overdose from prescription opioids more than quadrupled in, from 1999 to 2010. Um, of two and a half million Americans who abused or were dependent on opioids, fewer than one million received treatment. And I don't need to emphasize, because we see it in the headlines every day, and unfortunately, we see, uh, we get um, the news of a celebrity passing away from an overdose. And behind that one celebrity, there's so many more people that we don't hear about that are passing away. Um, and unfortunately, they get put into these big statistics that we say, um, and we're still not doing enough, and, and I include myself in that, uh, to provide that treatment. Um, and part of the problem is, it's not enough of us are, are, are trained, for example, to provide that treatment. So I'll talk about um, the X waiver. So medication-assisted um, treatment, which uh, I'm actually 
uh, moving away from saying so. Medication addiction treatment for opioid use disorder normalizes brain chemistry, blocks euphoric effects of alcohol and opioids, and relieves physiological cravings, normalizing body functions without the negative effects of the abused drug. Um, so oftentimes I will have patients who say, well, if I get on a medication for my opioid use disorder, then I'm just replacing one drug for another. And you know that is absolutely not the case because the medications that we provide don't, pr don't produce that euphoria that, um, that is associated with drugs that are abused. So there's, there's three medications um, and then one more that helps us. So methadone, methadone is really the gold standard. It's one of the most proven treatments in all of psychiatry and substance abuse literature. It's just over and over and over again uh, in large studies and small studies, it really improves uh, outcomes on, uh, on, re on uh, going back to using opioids, as well as other psychosocial outcomes, uh, such as um, incidents that can happen that are a result of using a drug. Uh, so for example, other medical comorbidities, legal consequences, and so on. Uh, methadone, as we know, is, needs to be dispensed by a methadone clinic. Buprenorphine um, is the medication that we can get uh, the, the privilege to prescribe with an X waiver. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in the policy world around making it so that more people can prescribe buprenorphine. Um, and let me see if the next slide has it. Nope. Um, so buprenorphine is a partial uh, opioid agonist antagonist. So it satisfies the opioid receptor, but it doesn't provide that high. And it also produces a ceiling effect when it comes to overdose risk. So someone who's on buprenorphine, who may be using other substances, I don't talk about benzodiazepines today, but uh, a lot of overdoses happen when someone's using an opioid as well as a benzodiazepine or opioid with alcohol, and the buprenorphine helps with producing a ceiling effect. And this is the medication that we can, we can do in office-based treatment, uh, where somebody doesn't have to go to a methadone clinic. Naltrexone, I mentioned naltrexone earlier with alcohol because there's a common pathway uh, for the addiction, um, which is an opioid antagonist. And so if somebody uses naltrexone, they can't take an opioid, and as a result, uh, it, they're able to have higher abstinent, full abstinence rates. Um, and then again, naltrexone is available as both a once daily pill and a, a monthly injection. And then finally, um, I, I need to make sure that I mention naloxone because naloxone is the overdose reversal um, uh, medication. It's available either as injectable or intranasal, and it can rescue somebody who's having an overdose um, temporarily, um, and then you would give another dose and then have someone seek em emergency treatment. So there's a lot of public health efforts to get naloxone kits out there. Um, in a national study, 122,000 people on methadone and 15,000 on buprenorphine found that the retention in those treatments was associated with risks in all cause and overdose mortality. Um, and then the Massachusetts study that was in the question, uh, only 30% of people received any treatment for opioid use disorder, um, and both buprenorphine and methadone were associated with decreased all cause mortality. So, of the people who need substance use disorder treatment, 2.1 million received treatment at any specialty facility for substance use problem, and 90% of people did not. So why don't people, why in, in large studies, um, epidemiologic surveys, uh, do folks say that they're not receiving treatment? 38% of, of respondents, um, and this is for drugs in general, this is from NISDA, or National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, are not ready to stop using. 29% or 27% don't have health care coverage or could not afford the cost. So again, those, those initial slides where I talked about having more access and more coverage rather um, doesn't necessarily translate in the real world. 20% um, don't know where to go for treatment. 14% did not find a program uh, offered, offering the type of treatment that they wanted. Um, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about addiction treatment and what is, what will work, what is evidence-based. And I think part of our roles as, um, as addiction providers is to make sure people have an understanding of that. Um, 
and and then responses related to uh, how what others will think of them. So what are barriers to access and outcomes? So some of the barriers are uh, financial and reimbursement barriers. Medicaid is expanding, um, but uh, in, in a study that looked at expansion of coverage, rate of treatment is still static. So even though we have more people technically covered, we're still not getting the treatments out there. Um, Pre-authorizations, many of us who have worked with buprenorphine uh, know that pre-authorizations have been difficult. Um, and luckily, for example, in, in California, which is where I'm from, uh, several years ago, Medi-Cal covered buprenorphine, so then had to get on the phone a lot less to get the treatment covered. Um, and then physicians and hospitals aren't always reimbursed or incentivized to treat. Unfortunately, the healthcare system is such that we kind of chase the problem after it's happened, and there's less of an incentive to try to prevent it um, uh, or treat it early on. And we're dealing with all the medical complications or the hospitalization when treating in the office might have uh, provided better outcomes. Um, regulatory issues, uh, as I said, there's a lot of policy work going into having X waivers uh, be more available or have more people be able to prescribe buprenorphine. Only 2.2% of physicians have an X waiver. That blows my mind. It's uh, an eight-hour training, and then you can start prescribing it. I am certified by SAMHSA and the American Psychiatric Association to do those trainings. Um, and we offered it uh, to our local APA district branch, um, which includes 1,200 physicians for just $25, I think, uh, to come to, to San Mateo and sit with me in a room for eight hours and get trained, and, and about 25 people showed up. Um, so it's, it's something that we need to get more publicity on and more information about. Workforce challenges. Training in addictions is poor, meaning that what we're requiring of, uh, of a lot of our uh, job roles uh, is not enough. In psychiatry, for example, psychiatry, addiction is a, uh, a DSM-5 diagnosis. Psychiatry, we only have to do one month of addiction training. Um, and as an addiction psychiatrist who decided after my psychiatry residency to go and do a fellowship in addiction, you know, that luckily my program offered me more time, but really one month is all you, you have to do according to uh, ACGME guidelines. Um, as I said, not enough physicians are offering treatment, and there's not enough time. Our systems, again, are designed, unfortunately, to treat the problem after it's happened instead of spending time up front. And then finally, stigma and patient level um, factors. Um, there, again, there's a lot of misinformation, um, and unfortunately, some disadvantaged groups really suffer from this. Um, women are less likely to get treatment. Uh, there's lower SES, uh, are less likely to get treatment, and co-occurring mental illness are also less likely to get care. So, in summary, substance use disorders are everyone's problems, but not enough. Um, physicians and other treatment providers are doing enough, and all of you are here, so I'm not saying this is you, it's almost like I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, um, but, uh, but we need to get the word out as people who are champions in addiction. Um, there are evidence-based treatments. They're just heavily underutilized. And over half of people across the substance use disorders want help, but they're not getting it. So we need to collectively work together and think of creative ways to get people into treatment because we're facing multiple public health crises um, and it's only going to get worse from here. On that positive note, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. I hope the insulin levels have leveled off a little bit. The, the little drum that's going to happen to you after eating. Uh, we'll try to keep you awake. And my name is Mario San Bartolome, and I'm an addiction medicine physician. I don't have any personal disclosures. Uh, I wear a lot of different hats for what I do. My wife likes to say that I have workplace ADHD. I, I wear hats on one part of my day. I serve as the national medical director for a health plan called Molina Healthcare. We're in 15 states in Puerto Rico, and I oversee all the substance use disorder stuff. So um, that's the kind of the administrative side. I also see patients day to day. Um, I'm the medical director for a uh, level 3.7 ASAM detox unit or withdrawal management, uh, as well as an RT, PHP, and IOP, as well as see people as, on an outpatient setting. 
And then I do a bit of consulting and uh, medical legal work. I'm a medical review officer, so I get to geek out on all the toxicology stuff, uh, the urine drug testing and, and all that kind of thing. There's always one person that likes to geek out on it. That's going to be me. And so I'm, I actually have uh, my hands in a lot of different areas. So I really enjoy substance use disorder uh, world in terms of working in there. It's a, it's a privilege for me. I'm originally trained as a family physician, and I consider addiction medicine, which I later got bored in, as well as really an extension of family, uh, family medicine. I mean, this, it's just really a, a continuation. This topic is going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about digital therapeutics. And it's uh, relatively new in terms of some of the, the tools that we have from the side of being FDA approved, but it's actually been a long time that we've had some sort of access to, to trying to tweak technology. And we're going to go through, this is our roadmap. We're going to define uh, digital therapeutics. We're going to talk about the viability. If it, is this something that we can really use in the, in the real world? Uh, we're going to talk about what sort of opportunities digital therapeutics afford us, any advantages, a little bit on some of the evidence that emerged that made digital therapeutics come about. Uh, we'll talk about fluency and monitoring, a specific aspect of what digital therapeutics can afford us to be able to, to use and leverage. Uh, very briefly about cost and about uh, clinical adoption. So lots to cover. So let's level set. What we really mean by digital therapeutics is very something very simple. And that's just that it's just something that leverages some sort of digital technology to look for adapting a solution to augment in medicine or in, in, in some sort of a psychological uh, intervention. Now, what it doesn't mean, and later on I'll maybe give a little bit more detail, it doesn't mean like WebMD. So anybody here ever have a patient come to you and say, oh, I've had a headache for like a week. I know I have a glioblastoma. <laughs> I've had a lot of that. kind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the Google, Google searches, okay? Um, it, it's actually something very specific, very rigorous. It has to be, all of you have taken classes and probably at some point had to study about epidemiology and about doing something, you know, you really have to be very specific about what kind of a tool something is, is you know, being used for. So that's really what it means. And, and so we have to decide on, if, is it a viable option? Now, Dr. Doss has given us a real good foundation to start thinking about, well, should we even be thinking about this? Is this something to spend our time? Right? We spend a lot of time on figuring out how to get to Mars. Is that where we should be spending our time? Or maybe the homeless problem that's outside the door. That's kind of like what we look at this. We have access problems. Now, I work with the access problems all day long. At the health plan that, uh, that I, I'm the medical director at, these are all Medicaid folks primarily, or Medi Medi. And so there are access problems all over the place. And, and so if only about 1 in 10 percent, about 10 percent of our folks that have substance use disorders are actually receiving professional help at some sort of a facility that's specifically for that, then really we should be looking at all opportunities. If you had a tool belt and you had a screwdriver, a hammer, something, you, you want as many of those tools as you want to build a house. And that's what we're talking about here. So absolutely, from the standpoint of a necessity, we need to continue to explore as many ways as possible to address substance use issues. And digital therapeutics, because of the, the, uh, the, the mode at which it actually uh, allows us to be able to trans transmit information, one, it's very convenient. Um, it's very familiar to people. How many people here have a smartphone? Yeah, probably most of you. I mean, if some of you are rocking a flip phone, you're awesome. You're probably, pretty, you're probably pretty effective, and you wouldn't be part of the group that's like checking every single moment, right? Because you have, a flat, have friends that have, on purpose, um, gotten flip phones uh, because of that. Because there's a whole other body of knowledge that we're learning about um, that has to do with some very you know, keen psychometric things that people have figured out about making even how Facebook and other things come about. Very, you know, I don't want to use the word addictive, but let's just say it's self-reinforcing. Um, and so... But, but it makes it familiar because you do 10 other things, at least, uh, with your phone. And this adds to one more thing you can do, um, or, or a tablet, or a computer. Um, it can be something that's confidential. If you wanted to do it and not go into blah, blah, blah recovery center and have to walk in there, which has been a barrier for some folks, if you're eight months pregnant and you feel fairly you know, judged, by having to go to a facility, which has been a problem. And this is one of the reasons why we like to co-locate treatment for, for say, somebody that has a, an issue with perinatal substance use. Um, for that group, this could be a good option because it, it's a little bit more anonymous. 
Um, now, does it, is it for uh, solving all the issues around that? No. Uh, but it does also afford us one other area that we'll talk about later, and that's the integration. So for those of you that raised your hand that said you were some sort of a therapist uh, or the peer support specialist or the physicians that are out there, at some point you're either doing motivational uh, uh, interviewing techniques, you're using very specific tools, uh, and this allows you to get more data. Now, how many people here would like more data instead of less data? When your patient goes out and doesn't come back for a month, and you're wondering what happened that during the course of the other 29 days, uh, wouldn't you want to have some sense of, of what's going on in terms of your treatment plan? And I think most of you probably would want more instead of less. So what sort of behavioral interventions are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the world of substance use disorders. So I'm going to focus primarily on, and this is the one we have, kind of have a little bit more information on, and that's with cognitive behavioral therapy, or a version of that, community reinforcement approach. Uh, and you all know that this is more or less, you know, the goal of that is to, make, is to make some sort of a mixture in your life so that abstinence is more appealing, more of a reward than the things that you're deriving from the substance use. That's the general approach, nothing too fancy. And, and we also put together, uh, for the most part in our world, contingency management, where we're, we're mix, mixing up some of the, the inputs and then looking at uh, reinforcement, particularly positive reinforcement. And it's been very successful in, in various groups. So overall, we're looking at pairing those skills in some sort of a way uh, to change a behavior and, uh, and then to, pro to provide incentives. So this is, where this is, again, where digital therapeutics begins to have some sense of a, a role is when we can mix some of these already existing techniques that all of you do so well already in the world to add one more tool, right? You had a Phillips screwdriver, now we're going to add a flathead screwdriver, okay? Um, and there are opportunities that are important um, around digital therapeutics. Um, one is that it provides us with a way to standardize something, okay? So um, one of the issues that come about is that when you're comparing things, you want to be able to do apples to apples comparisons. So Digital therapeutics, because of the nature of how you develop, say, the software, and I'm not talking about any specific one. I'm using this very general, okay? It allows us to be able to deliver the same thing to, to, to the same group. Um, the other thing is that it can reduce variability. And by the variability I'm talking about is the ones that happen when somebody's in front of you. Because, you know, you got cut off on the freeway and, uh, you know, something happened with your kid, you had to take him to school, and then your attention's a little bit off, and then there's your patient. And then the next day, you're in a real good mood, and everything's all working, you just read a great article, and then the patient, another patient comes in, same topic, there's probably still going to be some variations, because between therapists, um, even, uh, th there's a lot of variability, even the same topics and how it's delivered. But in the case of a digital therapeutic, then that can be controlled, controlled for to some degree. Uh, and so that's an, another uh, positive area. And then the third one would be optimization, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but we are in a special era right now. And on s one end, it may be a little Jetsons-like. I'm dating myself. Some of you may not know who the, the Jetsons used to be a cartoon. Um, fancy stuff, right, where they would do, wave a little wand and something would happen or they'd have special foods. We're doing that now, okay? So we are in the Jetson time, but things like AI artificial intelligence, is already being built into your electronic medical records. They're already being used, hopefully, to try to avoid errors. So for you doctors out there, there's already systems that when you're putting in a medication, there could be something else that pops up and tells you about it, in, uh, some sort of a, a contraindication for it, with a paper attached to it, with some sort of other information on an alternative uh, for that particular patient. And in the future, this will get more and more sophisticated. We'll be able to use information that looks at the pattern of what they're looking at, what that particular patient's been looking at, spending time looking at, and what sort of a genetic pattern they might have. I mean, this is not too far away. We're already using a lot of these uh, tools. Uh, but that optimization allows you to, to uh, customize. And that's what I'm getting at. You get to have something very specific for that, depending on the interaction that that person has with the device. So that mode of delivery becomes very, very important. Um, it, we mentioned already about the idea of overcoming a, a stigma or the idea that you know, noise can be a, quite anonymous. So that mode it lends itself to that. And that's by, you know, by having your phone or, or, or some sort of an, uh, an app that you can use on another device. Um, also, Dr. Doss had already told us a lot about some of the barriers, things like cost. But there's also the other kind of barriers that have to do with availability. In my world, on the, say if I'm talking from a, with a group of health plan folks, I would call it network adequacy, right? If you're in some rural population, and let's say you have a 
big fat wallet. You're just, you have money. Not, money's not a problem. You could pay out of pocket. And you're insured. No big deal. But the closest person that knows what they're doing is 200 miles away, which might happen in a place like New Mexico, for example. Well, then it doesn't help you then. And so having a digital therapeutic, there's, it's agnostic to all that. It doesn't matter the distance. And so there are some uh, you know, positive aspects to digital therapeutics from that end. And also, we mentioned the fluency-based. And by fluency-based, I'm talking about that adaptive part. So in one situation, and we'll get, I'll maybe explain a little bit more later on, but um, it allows the particular patient, client, uh, to be able to pace themselves along the process, depending on how well they're doing and performing uh, on their cognitive behavioral therapy uh, module. So we start looking at some of the evidence, and you know, we're not going to go into great detail on this, but what sort of things started moving the, 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 you know, moving the process forward to say, this is something we could do. Uh, one study uh, showed that, it was a comparative study, of computer versus therapist, uh, based outpatient CRA and CM, so the same model that we're talking about that we're all used to, uh, specifically for those patients that have an opioid use disorder and are receiving buprenorphine uh, medication-assisted treatment. So in this case, what we saw was a similar number of total and continuous weeks abstinent, and also that those that had a computer-based treatment required less therapist intervention time. So now that could trans... You can look at this in a lot of different ways. On one end, that last one means, well, you can spend less money uh, for some groups uh, with you know, a little bit, little bit less therapist time um, and have the same type of a, a result in terms of the engagement for some people. A, second, a separate study looked at, also a comparative study, patients with substance use disorders, not people uh, receiving medication-assisted treatment, um, and getting the computer-based cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, those that received the cognitive behavioral therapy, they had more drug-free urine drug tests. So in our world, what, what do we look at some of these endpoints? The number of urine drug tests is an example. How long somebody stays engaged in treatment. Uh, maybe uh, if they, you know, how, how often they show up to other things that are important that are the social determinants of health. And so this study looked at the number of drug-free urine drug tests um, for all you know, major analytes, so the, the different drugs. Um, and they stayed in treatment longer. And then when they were asked about how they felt about the treatment itself, they actually rated it very positive. And so we know that addiction really is a chronic relapsing disease. Do we expect that one treatment is going to be fixing everything? No, right? So the idea of how a patient or a client views what they're getting for that treatment could be quite important to see if they ever come back to it. So what I'm getting at here, though, is that we're still talking about an adjunct. This is still... This is an, an, an additional thing. And that led us to larger scale studies where uh, the federal government got involved and we have multi-site, randomized control trials. And in this case, looking at substance use disorders, uh, again, not receiving medication-assisted treatment. And in this case, uh, what we found was that there was an increased uh, retention rate over 12 weeks. That was the, the, uh, the length of this particular study. And that's about where we have most of the knowledge to is around uh, 12 weeks. Some studies have, have seen up, up to about 23 weeks. Um, they were equally affected as once they, when this group was actually separated to um, one that was, was uh, um, abstinent at baseline and then another group that was not abstinent at baseline. And we saw about the same results for those that were abstinent at baseline. Okay, for those whoops, that received um, treatment as usual versus the cognitive behavioral therapy intervention with a digital therapeutic. The interesting part was actually in the group that came in that was not abstinent, because that's where we saw the difference, that if they did engage in the use of that digital therapeutic, they had almost doubling of a rate of, of, uh, of abstinence, the odds of abstinence, compared to treatment as usual. Okay? And that difference was like between like 20% to 40%, right around that, in terms of magnitude. Okay? So that led to then the first real FDA-approved prescription digital therapeutic. Now, we've had digital therapeutics around for a while, and they've all been some version. A lot of them are university-based. They're being studied. They're robust. They can sometimes be used in pilots and a lot of different uh, grants uh, funding them. But this one kind of went through and, um, and, and got FDA approval. Recess from a company called Paratherapeutics, the only one we have right now, 
uh, but the first one here, Reset, which is um, the one that was introduced in 2017, and then Reset O for opioid was introduced in 2018. And so what you're looking at here, and, and I'm going to pretend this could even be a question. The 90-day prescription digital therapeutic is the Reset, the one that's just for SUD. Um, and then compared to the Reset O, which is 84-day, okay, so you can remember those numbers, um, the indication is a substance use disorder of some kind. Um, it provides cognitive behavioral therapy. It's meant to be an adjunct to the contingency management that gets done in, could be in a program, could be in, a, in, a, in an average office. And it really is meant for use with a clinician. It's not meant to stand on its own. It's not, in fact, they tell you right off the bat, this is not meant to be a standalone treatment for, uh, for substance use disorder. Because it does require, uh, and I'll show you in a moment, that feedback loop that adds information for the clinician so the clinician can further refine their treatment plans. In the case of Reset O, the main difference here is that it's the patient population that is receiving medication, uh, in particular buprenorphine, right? Not, uh, not naltrexone, uh, it's not been tested. Could it maybe one day? It's possible, but these studies did not necessarily, those, those studies have not been done effectively so that uh, we could say that. So really, this is an adjunct to, to MAT. Um, and it's still also under the supervision of a clinician because, of course, to receive buprenorphine, do you have to see a clinician? Yes, right? So this is not meant to be replacing anybody. This is meant to be another tool, right? That, that new screwdriver. And this is an example of, uh, of what you would see. Now, in this case, this digital therapeutic uh, spent a lot of good effort in trying to make things, the graphic user interface, pretty, pretty workable. On the right side, you have what the clinician would see. And that, you know, the kind of the software you would need would be just any standard computer, PC uh, or, or Mac. Um, and you can see that what it does is it creates a dashboard that, that at any given day that that person is interfacing with the different modules that, that involves cognitive behavioral therapy, you're getting feedback on the triggers, you're getting feedback on how well they're performing, the, the, the software itself can start adjusting areas and the patient can also interface to be able to adjust the pace so that it's at their own pace. Um, and then the patient, it's, those are, are primarily uh, handheld device or tablet type of uh, software that you would need. Um, and, and it's a different type of uh, interface for them, but they know it's in the, kind of through the auspices of your therapist that you are, um, you're using this. So when you go to your follow-up appointment and the the therapist can look at the dashboard, and they might, you, might, you might already have something in mind in your treatment plan. However, a whole month passed. What's been going on in a month? You assigned them to do this work, to tr work through these exercises. Did they do it? What are the odds that maybe somebody could not be telling the truth? I mean, look, and that's not why we're doing this, right? But it's just it's that, it, that that means engagement, that's all. It just means that we need to maybe, what it tells you is that maybe something else needs to be tweaked. Maybe that's not the, the best way to go about it. But in this way, we get the feedback. And it's made in a way so that people want to interface with it. So it makes it so that it's, it's a little tastier for the person to want to go and engage. So that's where you also get this uh, longer length of, of engagement. And that idea of, of fluency-based, we know that fluency-based type of tools, they do a few things. One is that they, they improve long-term knowledge retention, okay? Number two, they also improve somebody's the, um, actual self-monitoring time, like the amount that they self-monitor. So how often do you think your patient, your client is right after your visit, they're going home and thinking through everything you guys talked about and trying to figure out how that compares to the last time or that was the future time, probably they're not. They're getting out of there, getting to traffic to go home and do whatever they're doing. But this way, it's already there. The next time they look up, they can see progress. They can, they can then communicate with you and they can, they can tell you, yeah, this was uh, more important to me than not. Or in the case of for, the, for the dashboard, where you can show them right then there in your office, look, this area right here seems to be a really important area that seems to be uh, coming up over and over again in, in your performance going through the CBT exercises. Do you want to talk more about this? And, and so it gives you an added tool. Uh, so fluency-based, uh, really, that allows you that little bit of customization. I think that in, the, in, in terms of in the whole scope of things, digital therapeutics, will become much more robust around the AI, uh, the artificial intelligence part, and give us even more information in the future. So you'll be able to integrate, for example, let's say you give them access to educational content. 
you'll know how, how many ones they clicked. How long did they stay on it? Did they read it? Did they answer questions uh, about it? Are they showing fluency? Uh, uh, um, are they showing an ability to, uh, mo to modulate some of the cues or the, understand the triggers? All the, that information will be added. And we know that some of these have some dose correlates as well. It's been studied as well. And we know that if they actually go through the modules, that they have a, an improved chance of staying in treatment. Uh, not unlike you would see in, in somebody attending uh, therapy. There have been some studies, not a lot, uh, showing uh, cost. Now, some of the cost improvement could be uh, you know, taken as, well, you don't need as much therapist time. But also, actually, even in the, when we're talking about having the therapist time, if you start extrapolating out costs that re are related to somebody staying engaged in treatment, then there's a cost there, too, if they fall off. So uh, in some studies have shown, for example, that somebody that's, uh, let's say, a chronic pain patient that has an addiction, that is receiving medication-assisted treatment, in some studies in some universities where if that person falls off the grid and leaves treatment, that can represent $30,000 to the health plan every time. And so that's another way that some people will quantify this. And so when you start looking at this, if somebody stays in treatment longer, then they're looking at that as a, as a positive. So any, anybody that has um, a, an, an ability, well, in the, in the case of reset, I believe it has to be somebody with... Um, an ability to prescribe like uh, like you would normally from, from yeah or a nurse practitioner or a PA I might be wrong I might be that might change and I'm not going to be spending too much time about the specifics of any one product but um, the way that these generally work is that you you base at least this one the, the reset one there's an enrollment form and so you basically just need the patient's email and then what happens is one of their folks contacts the patient and works through all that part about trying to get it covered. Because if it's FDA approved, then you have a chance of getting it the, covered by insurance. That's kind of the whole point to that, right? But that's, that was their whole, I think, probably their whole move. Anyone that wants to have any sort of a, a penetration uh, into providing any product wants to have it FDA approved. Yeah. So there's a, these are additional ones that you can refer to that isn't an FDA approved one, but they've been used and they incorporate other tools like messaging system, uh, other like predictive uh, uh, un pr predictive tools for relapse prevention. Um, another one uh, that's been used is part of a, a substance abuse treatment programs, CBT for CBT. So some of these you can you can begin to look at now and start seeing some of the studies that were done. But also, virtual reality is another one that we see that's coming around. Um, I've had some involvement in this for the outpatient setting for folks with, uh, that are, that are uh, being treated with medication assisted treatment. This is an exciting one as well because you create experiences out of that one, right? And, um, and so there are some, if you're really interested in this, go to the uh, Digital Therapeutic Alliance, uh, these websites that there's folks that are trying to, you know, standardize some of these things. So at the end, what we could say is, you know, there's some evidence here to support that there's some a viability in a clinic, both clinically and, and by cost, to use digital therapeutics, at least in the world of opioid use disorder, you know, where there's medications involved, and also in general SUDs for that group of folks that we talked about. Okay, and when we talk about this, I already mentioned before that digital therapeutics means uh, something very specific, and that's why there's that FDA involvement, not like general, well, not WebMD, not Medscape, um, and that one of the challenges that we still have is how to best choose the patient that would do well on it. That's something that you know in the future we're still figuring out. Uh, also, how to teach other therapists and physicians how to integrate. The technology, like Dr. Doss mentioned, if you're in a, uh, um, some sort of a mechanism of a 10 or 15 minute visit, well, how do you add that now to the whole mix? One more thing to do. Um, and education. And lastly, what we'll talk about here is just some of the challenges that are around the adopting of uh, new technologies, which is in any, if you look at it as a big organization, one is that the organization really has to uh, accept uh, and increase attention and accessibility across the enterprise for any sort of technology that you begin to put in. Um, it, the, tech, the, the, the technology needs to be something that is easily thought of as something feasible and effective. Uh, there needs to be a lot of resources uh, attached to it, and all the players have to be, you know, people like you that are in the room where you have not just the physician group, but you have the therapists involved, you have the peer support specialists, because what other um, type of specialty in the world of substance use is more team-oriented? than substance use. I mean, really, there's never a one important person in the room. It's like it just depends on what you're talking about. 
so everybody needs to be engaged for adopting something to, to, to actually work. Um, and so I mentioned this as a, a, an example of, you know, in the case of a virtual reality, not only an office-based outpatient treatment, but it's already being used, for example, in residential treatment centers or in withdrawal management and detox centers, where we're looking at how do we decrease the amount of medication I give somebody. If I can give them a tool where they can decrease anxiety, use mindfulness, have experiences that let them cope with what's going on at the moment, can I decrease the risk of the burden from chemicals, for example, during that time? This is an example of what's to come. So 